Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben and this is the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. Today we're kicking it off in episode 2 of season 7. So we're travelling around Australia in season 7 and I'm actually starting this season, I'm tracking down the top 5 ABA and KCBS teams from 2019. So we're working our way through that list and I've got a very special guest for you but I'm going to tell you about him in just a minute. So by now we're in January, I'm sure everybody's back at work, hope that hasn't been too hard on you. Um, I know it's been a bit of a shock for me. I had two beautiful, relaxing weekends off here on the Gold Coast. It's uh, it's a hard life. We've got the beaches and the sunshine and, um, you know, it's, it's pretty rough. But, hey, someone's got to do it, right? But my question that I want to know is what are you looking forward to in 2020? So are you looking to up your barbecue game? Are you looking to perfect a hand in? Are you looking to join the competition circuit? Are you looking to leave the competition circuit and escalate into something else? Maybe you're moving into a rub and source company. What are you looking forward to for 2020? What I want you to do is jump on the socials, track down the post for this episode and in the comments there, tell me what you're looking forward to. So For me, I'm already planning my next overseas trip. So in April this year, I'm getting the family together. We're heading back over for the 2020 NBBQA conference. We had an absolute ball last year, running around there, interviewing people, for uh, doing photography, videos, all that sort of stuff. And I'm using inverted commas, networking. Um, As as one person said to me, we were networking 12 ounces at a time. And uh, But this year is very exciting. They've actually invited me to come and present. So I'm going to be jumping up on stage. I'm going to be presenting in in front of this conference. It's in, it's incredibly, uh, um, it's an honor, but it's also incredibly, uh, a little bit intimidating as well. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I've uh, settled on my topic. I'm going to be presenting on building brands with social media, a strategic approach to digital media management. So we're going to look at how people can use um, social media and leverage that to the best of their abilities to build their barbecue brands. And if you'd like to help me out, it'd really mean a lot if you headed over to smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop and grabbed a t-shirt or some of, or some of the other cool merch that we got over there. That'd uh, spin a couple of bucks my way and it'd really help us out to get over there to NBBQA. Now, today's guest, very cool guy. I've got Paul King from King and His Q. He is the KCBS Team of the Year for 2019. So yes, that is right. I've got the number one team for KCBS Australia in here, in the, in, the, uh, in the confessional. He's going to be joining us and we're going to find out where he's come from, where he's going, and we get a lesson in how to prepare prize-winning KCBS-style pork butts. This is really going to be super, super cool. So let's get into it. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Paul, my friend, welcome to the confessional. Thank you for joining me. Uh, cheers, Ben. Happy to ha- happy to join you, mate. You have had a cracker of a year, haven't you? Uh, we certainly have this year. We've done quite well, thank you. So, sort of, uh, let's let's before we get into twenty nineteen, let's jump all the way back. Tell me about how you got into barbecue. Um, well. It's funny enough, I'm, I've been a chef since uh, I was the age 15, so we're talking 1987 I first kicked off, started cooking food. Um, I've always cooked food and, you know, grilled steaks and burgers and whatnot and prepared meals, and I've actually smoked chicken over rice and tea, uh, tea and du- smoked duck, and to me, all I ever knew was barbecue ribs were you know grilled grilled over a charcoal grill and served to my customers and then back in 2016 uh one of my i I, I was teaching at tafe and one of my fellow teachers came to me and said oh here try a bit of my smoked chicken that i did and you know i'd smoked chicken before and thought nothing of it but anyway i tried this guy's smoked chicken i went oh geez that was good how'd you do it and he explained that he, he had a, a gas smoker and he put a, some uh, wood chips in this gas smoker and he created smoke and he did it that way. And I thought, oh, well, that's pretty cool. Um, maybe I should look into it. So I had a, a Weber kettle at home and 
started doing some research on the internet and found out that, you know, I could smoke ribs and brisket and, you know, chicken and on my, on my Weber. I went, oh, you beauty, here we go. <laughs> well, yeah, this is going to be fun. And I thought, well, I, it's not going to cost me a lot of money to set up, you know, I've already got the barbecue. So what I did is I, I did some research and, you know, I went out to barbecues galore and I bought some wood chips and, and I soaked them in water and because that's what the internet told me to do. And I was away soaking, got my charcoal, my heat beads in there, put my wood chips on top and I made some um, hamburger patties. I thought, well, look, you know, it's either going to go really good or go really bad. So I, I've got these heat beads boiling away and I've put some wood chips on top and smoke's coming out the top of the web and I thought, yeah, I'm on fire. <laughs> this, is, this is great. And I put in, my, put in my meat patties and my wrist hole patties and I'm smoking away and I'm like guess, guessing the whole situation. Anyway, ends up by you know, 20 minutes, half hour later, I pulls out these meat patties tasted one i went oh jeez they're f- terrible Ooh. so yeah sorry about that but you can bleep that one <laughs> um i said these are terrible i gave one to my dog and she wouldn't eat it so <laughs> my wife was being really polite and she turned around oh they're lovely darling so yeah my first attempt at smoking meat patties or rissoles was absolutely balls up and it was like back to the drawing board and yeah, I had a bit more research and I had a crack at doing some ribs, like spare ribs, and they actually turned out really well. I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. And this is not, uh, pro- this is before Barbecue Smokers opened up. I think uh, they opened up in January of 17, I think it was, or it may have been 16, not quite sure. Don't quote me on it. Anyway, I found out they were bringing Horizon Smokers in. And I said to my wife, I said, oh, come on, let's go and check out this barbecue shop. It's, you know, it's new at New U Butte and it's opening up. And we went down there and uh, we we looked at Horizon and looked at Bullets and, you know, I had a price range in mind and I saw this offset smoker, this 20-inch Horizon offset, and I'm just like, oh, wow, got to have one of those. Yeah, love at first sight. Yeah, well, it was love at first sight. And anyway, yeah. Um, by, by the time I walked out of there about an hour later, I'd paid 50% deposit on this um, this Horizon 20-inch and, yeah, that was it. It's all been, a, I wouldn't say downhill, it's all been uphill from there. It's been great. It's been an adventure. Yeah. But, yeah, so really cool. So, you, so yeah. you started with a Weber and then moved up into the Horizon? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I did look at the, the, the big 22-inch uh, Weber bullets. Um, I couldn't get one of them in Australia. Uh, at the time, so or not that I knew where to find one if they were here. Uh, so yeah, that's why I ended up getting my, my Horizon offset, and I had that for over two years um, before I upgraded to my next my next big adventure. Right. My next big stroker. So did you did you keep the Horizon to, to to start off the collection, or did you move it along? Well, it was funny. I I, I got it because I'm a chef, and I was always looking at ways of making waking money i had i've previously run my own restaurant before um before i started teaching and there was always always the initiative of trying to make money out of something and i i did some research in my local area and there was no one in the area doing barbecue smoking and i thought i said to my wife i said oh come on let's go down to the markets every every second weekend and We'll take a brisket and a pork butt and a few brioche rolls and we'll, you know, we'll make some money on the weekends and um, start a small little catering business. So that's what we started doing. And we got our first catering job outside of the markets and we did that. And then we got an inquiry for another one and we did that. And we were running a box trailer with a Horizon smoker on the back and yeah, oh, we, we thought it was great guns. And <laughs> then we went to our first big event and we served over 400 rolls and I thought, wow, this is so cool. People people are loving my food. People are loving what I do. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. Um, 
we start. I said to my wife, I said, oh, let, where are we going to go next? And she said, oh, let's go to Southern Highlands. There's a food and wine festival. Oh, nice. So off we went down to Southern Highlands Food and Wine Festival and we catered down there and we got absolutely smashed, but sold out of food. And I'm just like, oh, wow, this is so cool. And I, I'd taken another two Horizons. I'd borrowed two Horizons from Barbecue Smoker. So I had three Horizons little 20 inch horizon set up down there and I'm smoking meat like a champion. <laughs> and I did that for two years in between doing everything else, which we did a couple of couple of catering jobs, a couple of small weddings and a couple of events. And after the second time I did Southern Highlands, I said to my wife, I said, honey, I can't do this because we'd we'd hire a Pantech truck and load all our equipment into the back of this Pantech truck, take it down to the Highlands unload it, you know, cook, cook for two days. And it was just, it was hard work. And because I'd been to Kansas city uh, the year before or over the, that year, the 12 months, I'd been to um, American barbecue systems and I'd seen a barbecue called the judge which, or the five foot judge. And I, I said to my wife, I said, Oh, look at this. What do you think? I said, this is, if we're going to do this seriously, then, you know, we need to to go all out. And she was like, yeah, okay. So I, <laughs> so she was starting to get a bit less enthusiastic by that stage? Oh, no, my wife has always supported everything I've ever done. Um, she's 100% buying. Like, she, she hates when I go, honey, I've got an idea. <laughs> she usually cringes. Um, but she's always been there supporting me in... in my catering and, and my barbecue adventures. Beautiful. So we imported this five foot judge. Um, it arrived, oh, geez, what was it? March, April last year, I think it was. Yep, yeah, I think it was pretty much last year. Um, so was it 2019? No, that's 2018 it arrived. Um, got it in and I saw it and was like, yep, this is cool. Then I, and then I had to build a trailer, obviously. I didn't build it. I got a fella in the Rellin, a uh, local bloke. He built my trailer for me and mounted the judge. And, yeah, that's my new catering catering trailer. And I haven't looked back since. So I can, yeah, catering-wise, smash it out the ballpark. No, no, no questions asked. Anything from 500 to 1,000 people. Uh, we just finished doing a four-day festival down at Summer Nats in Canberra. Um that was that was constant for four day three and a half days of cooking meat and we ended up turning over us five hundred kilos of meat we turned over. Wow. Give or take give or take a little bit. And the judge never batted an eyelid. She was good value. That's awesome. If there's a, if there's ever gonna be any event where people are just gonna be lining up for giant beef ribs and whatnot, it's gonna be summer nats. Well, yeah, other than meat stock in Sydney and Melbourne, um, yeah, that some nats they, they were lined up. Uh, for sure, they were 10 to, 10, 10 to 15 deep and we had, you know, f- five to ten people waiting at one time. So, <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the boys at Summonats and, and the ladies, they loved, loved our barbecue. Did you get and to see we, many of the cars? Uh, we saw it. Well, we, we did take it. I took a quick walk on the um, Friday and took a couple of happy snaps and a couple of quick photos for a Facebook post and then on Sunday morning... Um, it was one of the quieter days before it kicked in around about lunchtime. We, my wife and I, we went for a walk around Skid Row, um, down through the the, um, the showrooms and saw some of the the top sixty cars. Uh, we were also probably about two hundred meters away from the main burnout track, so there yeah, we were definitely copping gusts of uh, tire smoke over the week, <laughs> over the weekend. But that um, no, was great fun definitely be looking forward to doing that again next year well hopefully the air intake on the judge is down nice and low so all that tire smoke was just passing over the top yeah no it was it was going straight over the top yeah there was no hassles there <laughs> so that's your uh, your background in in uh chefing and and catering um one of the questions that i wanted to ask you was as a chef and as a caterer is the buzz that you get from serving people the food and, and and them saying how much they like it? Is that the same buzz um, as being a chef, or is it different when you're when you're serving barbecue? Uh, 
no, no. Look, I've been in a a la carte restaurant serving, you know, 100 meals in, in a couple of hours and, and you got the stress and the adrenaline and it's all pumping and, you know, you're getting feedback from your customers and you get good feedback, you get bad feedback. Uh, it's it's the same as barbecue. Like, in a situation where I'm, I'm cooking meat for 8 to 12 hours, you know, I've, I've worked my heart out, I've put my love into it, and then I'm, I'm serving up to my customers and they're coming up and they're telling me that, you know, that's the best pork, pulled pork or the best brisket or that was great, that was tasty. And occasionally you get someone coming up saying, look, you know, I didn't like that, Can uh, you, you could use this to fix it. Yeah, everyone gets complaints, I'm not going to say I don't. Um, you know, and you take that on, on your shoulders and you do that to improve your your barbecue and your, and, and your customer service and what you provide. So it, there is an adrenaline rush in there. But you talk about adrenaline, the, the biggest adrenaline rush you're going to get is when you're doing barbecues, barbecue competition. That's a different ball game all again. Absolutely. And that was where I was going next. Now, I've heard, I've heard two rumours, and you can tell me if this is true or not. <laughs> the, the first yeah. rumour I've heard, is that your first comp was the Royal and the second rumour I've heard is that you've actually trained under Harry Sue. Well, yes, that is correct. My first barbecue comp that I ever competed in uh, was the American Royal. Oh. Was 2016. <laughs> and, we, and we competed in the open category. Um, and yes, uh, pre- the September, oh, sorry, how was it? August. Might have been the end of August, start of September. Um, Harry Sue came to Australia uh, for a a class at Barbecue Smokers and I was fortunate enough to spend the four to five days um, working alongside Harry and watching what he did and, um, you know, picking up tips and tricks and inside information and things that, you know, may not have been passed on to the, the class. So... I consider myself pretty lucky to actually have that done. Um, so I worked with Harry and then it was mentioned, it was said, oh, look, do you want to go to um, the Royal? Because I actually mentioned to the one of the fellows at Barbecue Smokers, I said, oh, it'd be pretty cool to do a barbecue comp. And it was like, hang on a sec, you want to go do barbecue comp? I went, yeah. So, all right. So we, we booked tickets. We flew out to Kansas City. Um set up in, booked the site, set up in tent. And, yeah, it was on from young and old. We flew, Harry flew in on the Saturday night because he taught a class in California. Then he flew to Kansas in Missouri. We picked him up at midnight. He slept in the back of our, our van um, while we slept in the, in the, in the tent. Then once... Um, time to cook was light fires we get up we got up and lit fires and then harry woke up an hour later basically what he did was he oversaw what we did like how we how we put the meat in the box how we presented it um as a as a general master or a teacher you may say and all, all the rest of the cooking and the instructions and the wrapping and the foiling was up to myself because i was actually the head cook of that team Wow. So hang on. Wait, wait, wait. Your first ever barbecue competition was the Royal. You were yes. in, you were invited through an extension of your uh, interaction with Harry Sue and, yep. and you were the head pit master of that team. That's correct. That is so, wild. Yeah. So I was, I was the head cook of that team for probably two years and or head pit master, whichever you want, wish to call it. And then in... 2019, I decided to part my own ways and go and do my own thing. Um, yeah. Continue my catering and I started my own competition barbecue team. Which brings us to, of course, King and his Q, your, your your current team. That's correct. So tell me about that team. Um, like I said, the, the King and his Q started off as a catering, catering business or a catering team, um, my husband and wife team. Um, we, we've started that or and we were been cooking for events and markets and private parties and then that was in 2016 and the 20 end of 2017 start 
And in 2019, um, I left the other team and I said to my wife, well, you know, we've been catering and doing our thing and she knew that I wanted to continue along the competition circuit and I said, look, you know, are you there for me? Do you want to do it together? And she's 100% yep, like, you know, let's let's do this together. Let's go and be the King and His Q competition barbecue team as well as the King and His Q catering. And we were sitting in January 19, about to go to Phil Collins, and we turned around and said, oh, look, that tickets are on special for the US. I said, come on, let's go to let's go to California and we'll do our first barbecue comp in May. And oh. she went, are you serious? I went, yeah, come on, let's go. So we booked tickets while we are sitting there waiting to go into Phil Collins and we uh, made, made contacts. So I knew people in California and we made contacts to go to Norco in California and cook there, which was our first uh, barbecue competition for 2019. Wow. I didn't even realise that. So you're – so okay, okay, so the first competition for the new team, just you and your wife, you decide yes. to throw it all in and, and go to California to, to Norco, and that's as late in the year as May, and by the end of the year you've finished at the top of the ladder. That's correct, yes. Wow. Okay, so first of all, tell me about Norco because that looked awesome. Well, Norco is uh, pretty cool. Um, it's in a big equestrian centre or – it's in a, it's a large shed with no walls, and so it's fully undercover. And they, it's Norco is a horse town. Uh, you can drive down the main street, and you'll see people riding horses. They've also got rails that you can tie your horse up to. It's oh, real, very cool. It's real country. Um, so the competition's held in the Norco Equestrian Area or Horse Arena. Um, basically, we bumped in on the Friday and yeah, meeting inspections as per normal. Um, and we, we cooked barbecue for on the Saturday for, for, for guests or for the judges. So it was, it was interesting. And was that a KCBS competition or was that a, like a, um, a, a self managed competition? No, no, it was, it was all, it was all KCBS. Um, Debbie Yock, uh, is the organiser. She also is in conjunction with Jason Jason Minto from Barbecue Events Australia, who do the Brew and Q Festival in uh, Perth, Perth as well, which is held in October. So they're, they're the, the mother and sister or mother and father events that they've set up, whereas the winner from Norco goes to Australia to represent the US and whereas Australia... GC goes to the US to represent um, Australia. That's awesome. So, so it's a pretty cool event to be involved in and to actually aim to win the, the GC. So, sorry, are you saying that you took out the GC there? No, no, no. no I didn't take the GC. Oh, okay. Yet. Sorry. I was close. Yeah? Yeah, I was pretty impressed by, by, by our cook. Yeah. Um, when I first arrived in Norco, I, know, I knew a couple of um, gentlemen, uh, KCBS judges and people that I'd spoken to through the last, previous couple of years. And I said, look, as an Australian team come to cook in the US, if I sit middle of the pack, so, you know, top 25 because there was 50 teams, I said, look, I'm happy. You know what I mean? I, like, you know, the US guys cook it every weekend or... Oh, yeah. You know, they practice, they, you know, they... You can't go to a weekend without doing a barbecue comp in the US. Anyway, um, we settled in. I was cooking on um, Gateway Drums, which I'd borrowed from Tim Shear, uh, the, the maker of Gateway Drums. And I did my cook as what I, I thought was, you know, the best of my ability or, you know, I did my best. Um, tried my hardest. Anyway, we're sitting at Rewards. Uh, chicken comes up first, as as it does, and they're going through top ten, and you know we're sitting there. And I said to the die, I said, "Look, you know, we'll see how we go." Anyway, next thing you know, fourth place chicken. Oh, Wait, hang on a sec. Wow, fourth place chicken out of fifty odd teams. This is all right. Yeah. My daughter, Diane, my wife, nearly fell over. She didn't know what to say. 
anyway, next one up was ribs. So we're sitting there, you know, same scenario. They're going through the top ten. Next thing you know, we pulls off um, eighth ribs. I mean, oh, this is this is too funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, first competition off the ranks, and we've had two calls in the US. I think, holy, <laughs> I must have done something right. So we sat there. We went through pork and brisket, and you know. Never got any calls. I'm, oh, that's okay. I'm happy. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got two. So they started doing the top 20. Yeah, and they got down to 10. And like, oh, well, you know, like I said to die, I said, die as long as we sat top 25, I'm happy. Anyway, we ended up pulling, they got to, they called it, called our name at eighth. We pulled off eight out of 50, 49 teams in Norco. Um, first competition off the ranks. So, we we're pretty pretty stoked about that. Yeah, sounds like a ripper of a way to uh, to kickstart the year. Well, it was. It was like holy, shit, you know, we've we've just done this. Yeah, you know, let's let's pack your bags and head back to Australia. Yeah, you know, where where are we going to go from now? You know what I mean? You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd Ben Arnott. So speaking of returning to Australia and and where do you go from there, you pretty much uh, sort of lit the Australian KCBS scene on fire after that, didn't you? Yeah, well, we did. Um, we got back into Australia and I can't remember when Redlands, the, the Queensland comp was advertised. With, I'm pretty sure it was advertised uh, before we went to Norco in May. Yeah, it was It was in June. So, yeah. Yeah. So we would we would have booked that one. We booked uh, Redlands, and what else? Oh, we booked Burley. I booked Burley well well in advance because as soon as I found out I was KCBS, I said to my wife, I "said Come on, we're going there too." <laughs> um, I had booked in to do Aussie World, which was the end of October, but I had to pull out of that one as um, the local show society asked me to cater their show ball, and you know. I thought, well, it's a good, it's a good, good for business to cater my own local business. So I catered, I catered the Aussie World, and I also missed out on Brew and Q, um, which was in October as well. But anyway, we headed off to um, Redlands, uh, thirty-two teams, I think it was. Uh, didn't change a thing. I had all my drums nice and clean. I packed them in the trailer. Off we went. And we ended up um, taking out GC there, so grand champion as well, in in, in Redlands. Back home, a couple more catering jobs, jumped in the car, packed the trailer, went off to Burley. Um, Burley was interesting. There was seven hand-ins in three and a half hours. Yeah, I know. That was intense. That was, yeah, that was pretty full on. Um, I think I, I, I lost it about... An hour in, or not lost it, but I, I was trying to concentrate on because I'm the only head cook. I do all the cooking. Yep. I, I was trying to concentrate on seven different proteins to make sure everything was doing it what it was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, once I got back to chicken, I was right. Um, <laughs> see, see, look, I, I, I cooked these beautiful scampi tails and I had some bug tails there and. I, I said to my, my wife, really wanted to serve our scampi, which looked like a, a, a yabby for those who don't know what they look like. And I, yep, I trusted my wife's gut feeling. So I served the scampi or put the scampi in the box and we ate the bug tails or the Morton Bay bugs. And we later found out that um, the Gold Coast judges like Morton Bay bugs. It was like, damn, I had the. Oh, had them sit there. no. <laughs> our, our, our scampi didn't score well, whereas our bugs might have done better. So we, we, we pulled off an RGC at Burley, Reserve Grand Champion. Um, so we are happy about that. That's all well and good. So we've had one GC, one RGC, and then back to Sydney, a couple more catering jobs, and it was a last-minute decision to head to Melbourne to go and cook um, the Melbourne Cup Day. Because the points, we're following the points t- tally now. And I'm thinking, hang on a sec, we're getting close to the top here. Yeah. You know, this, this is this is looking real interesting. 
anyway, my wife could said to a boss, can I have the day off? She, he said, yeah, no worries. So we jumped in the car, drove to Melbourne, bumped in. Cook didn't go quite as planned. We, we did pull off, a, I think it was a first place ribs and a first place pork butt. So very happy with that. Uh, we got eighth overall. And it was like, oh, geez, not quite what I wanted. But anyway. Still still top just, 10 though, Paul. Yeah, oh, still <laughs> top 10. I'm not greedy, but anyway, still top 10. So we drove back to Sydney and I'm sitting here on the couch after we unloaded everything. I said to Di, I said, oh, there's a comp on in Perth this weekend. She goes, you can't be serious. <laughs> I went. Hold my beer, I, watch this. <laughs> yeah, I said. If I can get all the gear, can I go to Perth? She said, "Make some messages or send some messages. See what you can what you can get, and if you can get it, you can go." So on Wednesday afternoon, I'm or Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon, I'm sitting here on my couch, sending text messages to Perth. Organised all my stuff. I flew out on Thursday morning. Um, to I didn't know what to expect. I knew Jason would look after me over there from barbecue events. Um, got there with Jason on Thursday afternoon, had a quick chat, organised some basic equipment. I got the contact for the meat, went round, spoke, saw me, saw the butcher. Yep, beautiful. Trimmed up all my meat. Friday I went round and saw a fella that he makes um, drum smokers, so they're not gateway drums, but he still made drum smokers. Um Spoke to him, got my drum smokers organised, and Saturday we bumped in, and yeah, it was crazy. And what what they did was yeah, okay, I flew flew for the other side of the country, and it paid off because I ended up taking Grand Champion over there, which sealed uh, KCBS Team of the Year for myself. Yeah, so uh, good. So, so yeah, good. Nah, it's crazy, but you know, you do what you got to do. So that's, if I'm counting right, that's three co- three competitions in Australia. That's four, correct, four. Yes. four comps in Australia, yeah. Two in Queensland, one in Victoria, one in Perth. Yes. And you live in Sydney. And I live in Sydney. <laughs> so you've, you've literally been all around the country this year for barbecue. That's it. And I'm probably going to do the same again this year. Fantastic. Right. I've already booked in two, yeah, I've already got two US comps booked in for this year. Ooh, um, are you allowed to tell me about them yet or are they still under wraps? No, no, I, I'm happy to, to, to tell people. I'm off to um, Norco again. Um, Deb, Debbie Yop uh, has asked me would I come across and represent Australia and come over and do my thing. So I, I said, yeah, I'll come over. And the week before that is a competition called Big Bear. It's up in the mountains um, out of LA and... Last year, it actually snowed there on the Sunday and it was zero degrees there on the Saturday. Ooh, I'm out. <laughs> uh, they, 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 it looks like a really awesome, challenging competition because you're high up in the mountains and gateway drums perform differently at sea level as well as um, high, in up at high, higher level elevation. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge for myself. Uh, and, and for the drums, so looking forward to that one as well. And we, oh, geez, KCBS comps in Australia. The only one that it's announced at the moment that we're attending is Australia Day um, at Bundalong in Victoria. So the 25th Northeast Barbecue Festival, we're headed down that way. Well, best of luck for that one. That That's looking oh, like a on. cracker at the moment. And there's the Perth Invitational. So, sorry. So oh, second week of yeah, February, I think. Second week of February. So I'm doing Australia Day in, in Victoria. Then two weeks later, I'm off to Perth for a, a comp, the Governor's Cup. And then as far as I know, there's nothing booked in in between February and May. Right. You never practice what, time. Yeah. I like I, I do a bit of practice, but, you know, it, you, you, the more you practice, the more you confuse things. Yeah, you're better off, you know, going into a competition and going, right, I've got my times right. I know what I want to rub it with. I know what I want to inject it with. I know how to trim it. Let's just get it on and cook it. So I do a little bit of a couple of practice cooks a year, but not a great deal. 
Fair enough. Yep. Fair enough. I when I was competing, I always liked to uh, pick one particular one and then do a do like a practice comp cook out in the yeah. backyard. Well, yeah, look, you know, if you can do that, I I just I I do I I'll do I did a chicken cook today just for shits and giggles. Um, it, it went okay. I put the wood chunks on too late and it got it, it put my chicken on straight after. It was probably had a bit more smoke than normal, but it was still tasty. Um, I tried something different. It didn't pay off. You know? So that means I go back to the original way I used to do it. Um, you know, every now and then I'll throw a brisket on there and try something there with a bit of brisket. But if I want to try different flavours on a, on a piece of beef, I'll use beef ribs because obviously they're quicker to cook, they're easier, they're smaller. You, know, you don't want to cook an a eight-kilo brisket or if you trim it up comp trim, you might end up with a five-kilo brisket. Um, you know, it, beef ribs, two different two rack, two three racks of ribs on there, two different rubs, two different flavors. You can still inject them. You're still going to get the same flavors, profiles, textures that we you're going to get out of a point or or a flat of a, of a brisket anyway. So up to yourself how you do it. Well, yeah, and I guess by uh, by sticking to the uh, beef ribs as well, you're not going to end up with as you said, five kilos of uh, flavour profile that you don't like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, 100% on that department. And you can inject them too if you really want to try a different injection. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Still, still have a field day with them. Yeah, yeah. So with all this um, FIFO barbecue competition that you're doing, what is the essential stuff that you always take with you from home on a, on a FIFO barbecue comp? All right, so if I'm going in Australia, um, I, I will actually, when I flew to Perth, just gone, I took, I measured all my sauces. So I measured out all my sauces, what I was going to take. Um, I took my wood chunks, only exactly what I needed. I even got to the point where I, I, I measured all, all my foils. So I knew that I was going to wrap a brisket in X amount of metres of foil. I tore that off. I knew I was going to have four racks of ribs, so I was double foiling. So there was eight pieces of foil. There was two pieces of foil for the chicken. So everything gets shoved in a suitcase. Um, all my rubs get and injections and shaker bottles, and you might only take two shaker bottles, and you might use a couple of water bottles when you get there. Yeah, you got you got to think smart. You got to think light because you've got twenty kilos of baggage to play with in Australia so you only take what you need and then obviously chemicals and cleaning products and lighters and fire lighters and things you can't take on an airline no they don't you like know, that very much do they no nah. <laughs> so you, you know that yeah you know you're gonna have to do a trip to Woolies where you're gonna have to buy some paper towel and I bought some alfoil just in case and you might buy Ziploc bags or you know if someone like me who's got Ziploc bags on hand I'd like Okay, how many bags do I need for chicken? Two. How many bags do I need for ribs? Two. You know, you're working out in your head because once you've done it a couple of times, you only take what you need. And and the cutting boards the same. You might take two cardboard cutting boards and a couple of thin plastic ones and foil trays. Like I think I took a small roll of um, uh, what was it? Bloody. Oh, I can't remember what it was. I took something small that just was, yep, I had space in the bag, shoved that in, take it with me. I think the big suitcase I took to Perth had all the barbecue stuff in it and my carry-on, which was nine kilos, had my clothes in it. <laughs> so, and then when when you fly to the US, it's a different ball game again. Um, I'm very fortunate to have met the people in, in in California that have barbecue the, the woodshed. So Patty 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 has the woodshed in um, California. I've met her. Um, she's on on we're friends on Facebook. I can send her a message and say, "Hey Patty, I'm coming over. Uh, I need this, this, and this," and she'll organise it for me. Um, but what when with sauces and rubs, what I usually do is I might take something over but not much and then I order from Kansas City barbecue shop or KC grilling or big puppers or blues hog I order my rubs get them delivered to the hotel so they're there ready waiting for me 
And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, you know that you're going to use half a bottle. So you order, you order two bottles, so you bring one back with you. Um, and you leave the other one there with one of the other barbecue guys that you set up next to. So you can't bring an open bottle back, but you can bring a full bottle back. Oh, interesting. I was, I, I was just about to ask that because I didn't think you'd be allowed to bring any food products in at all. Yeah, you, you can bring your food products in as long as you declare it. Oh, okay. So all, last year when I came back from the US, I had one suitcase, and this was in May, and it was I think I was allowed 23 kilos in a bag and I had 20 kilos of barbecue rubs and sauces. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, that's and that was that bag was chocolate blocks and that was just one bag and I, I my wife had another I think you were allowed two 20 kilo bags and the other one had clothes in it and my wife had a couple of things in her bags. You know it's so. it, it, it's kind of funny you say that on the last couple of trips that I've done I've bought little Weber mini barbecues over there because they're like 50 bucks for like a go anywhere or yeah. a uh, oh, 100%. You or a smoky them. joe and yeah, I'd, I'd, I I shoved them in my wife's suitcase. I had a guy bring um, brought a PK grill back. Oh, really? Yeah, collapsed this PK grill, P grill and put had it in a, had it in his suitcase and brought that back. Oh, like, that's pretty cool. I've I've got a PK 360 that weighs a lot more than uh, than 20 kilos. Okay, well, it, yeah. <laughs> someone I heard someone from the US, Australia brought back a PK. I was like, wow, that's that's pretty cool. Might what have been the PK original. Yeah, yeah, it probably was the original. The more than likely, but you know, when you fly into the US, you gotta you gotta have your contacts right. Um, I'm I'm in communications with Tim from Gateway Drum Smokers. Uh, he has drums in California, uh, in storage. He also has obviously drums in Missouri or St. Louis where he lives. So if I'm going to go and do a competition, it's either California or or the the American Royal or Missouri. And it's pretty much, hey, Tim, I'm looking at coming over. Can we organise this? Um, if he says, yeah, sure, no dramas, I've got this covered for you. Or you just put it out there with a couple of contacts I know and see, see depending on where you want to go, see if they can help hook you up. But that, the hardest thing is is knowing who to talk to over there and where, where, to, get, where to get your products from. So... A couple of years ago, I wouldn't have even thought about going to the US to do a barbecue comp because I wouldn't know where to start. Um, now, yeah, it's no no question about it. I know where I'm going. I know what I want to do. I know who to contact. And most of the time, you'll find 95% of the time, the guys in the US are happy, more than happy to help you out um, with what, what or put you in contact with people so you can get what you need. Uh, meat supply, you can go to Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club, pick up your pork butts, your ribs, you get your St. Louis cut ribs, no questions asked. Um, chicken, depending on what state you're in. in, in Kansas, you use a smart chicken. In California, there's another brand of chicken, I can't remember what it is, but I know the label. Um, you use that. And then for brisket, you contact Snake River Farms, then that's where it comes in handy to know someone in the US because you can actually get Snake Rivers home delivered and, and, and go from there. Get it delivered, you pay the price, where you go. Happy days. Yeah, very cool, very cool. Now, having having Tim from Gateway on your uh, on your speed dial has got to be handy, particularly when you're heading up to that, um, what do you call it, Burning Bear competition? A uh, big bear competition. Big bear yeah. competition, yeah. Now, you, you mentioned that you're going to be cooking at, at an elevation and the gateway drums perform differently at, at elevation. What advice has, has Tim given you on that? <laughs> um, basically, get them opened up, get them heated up as quickly uh, up to temperature. Um, normally at sea level, everything cooks quicker. So you've got to keep it shut down a little bit more. And at elevation, it cooks completely differently. And you've got to open it up, get the air in there, get the oxygen in there, keep the temperatures up. So there's, it, with a drum, it needs oxygen, needs needs air to, to breathe. And if it's so, snowing as well, then that's going to um, also sort of 
sort of, it's it's going to try and suck yeah. that heat out of that drum as well. So you're going to have it to kind of open it up and keep it hot, won't you? That's right. It, it, look, there's a couple of competitions I've seen photos of where they're actually cooking with drums with the snow built up around them. Um, and I've actually cooked in, um, under rain in a drum. All, all, all I do is just yeah, open them up, just get them, get them up, get them, keep that temperature up to 300. And as long as, you, long as it's sitting at 300, it's happy. So the more you open it up, the more the air it sucks in, the, 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 the temperature stays up. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Now, you did just mention just a minute there ago about um, about pork butts, getting your different meats over there in America. Um, yeah. I understand that you're going to give us a bit of a walkthrough about how you like to do your, your KCBS-style pork butts. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a run-through, um, what I like to do. So, yeah, where do you want me to start? Mate, start at the start. What are you looking for when you when All you're right, in the butcher so, shop and you're pitching your, and, and you're picking your pork butts? So, I, I deal with the uh, butcher over at uh, Cherry Brook. Um, so I purchased uh, my butts, pork butts, and ribs, and that through him. Um, but if I'm I'm just walking into Costco and I'm picking out a sun pork butt, one of the first things I do is I look and I find the money muscle and I put my hand around it to find the girth. I want to, I want the biggest and fattest money muscle I can possibly find. So I take my hand. There's a membrane around the fat seat. There's the fat at the bottom. Then there's a, a, a seam at the top. And I put my hand around and squeeze it to find out how thick it is. It looks a bit sus. You get a, <laughs> you get a few looks from customers because, like, you know, what's he trying to do there? But I grab the look for the money muscle. I count the serrations. So if, if you pick a money muscle up or a butt, pork butt up and you look at a money muscle, it's got stripes down the side or, or, or fat fat stripes down the side, you might call it. The more stripes, the better, the, the longer it is. So I, I look for things like that. Um, then, then what I'll do is I'll take it home. I will open the bag, obviously. Now, I flip it over, look at the fat. I look at the fat coverage. Because I'm cooking hot, cooking hot and fast and it's fat side down, I don't usually trim a lot of fat off the bottom. Um, I like to leave a good quarter inch, half inch of fat coverage. This, What this does is it protects the meat, it protects the money muscle, and it pr- pr- protects your spaghetti, which is under your fat. Um, then we flip it over and we get there and I'll... I'll trim it down. Basically, go three quarters in it. I'll find the money muscle. Then I'll cut a couple of centimeters back in from the money muscle, and I'll cut all that meat straight out. But I don't need it there. I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to cook it. Um, and I'll take that down to the the, the bone. I'll, I'll cut that out. Then I'll shape my money muscle. Trim it back a little bit separate it a little bit, round it off, make sure it looks good because I want that rub and that smoke to go all the way around the, the, the muscle itself. Um, so do you um, butterfly the money muscle or do you separate it completely? Uh, I, the money muscle stays attached uh, without actually show, showing you visually. Uh, there's, there's a couple of little fat, little seams, little muscles that connect to it. Whereas I'll cut down to the side of the money muscle and remove one of the muscles, which will open it up a little bit. And then that'll sit. What the aim is is to have the money muscle sitting on top of the fat in its original position without falling over a little bit. Because if it falls over that little bit, as the heat comes up, one side's going to get more bark and it's going to actually cook quicker. You want it to sit on top. Yep. It makes sense. Yep. All right, once I've done that, um, I'm happy with it. I'll, I'll, there's a couple of little gnarly bits that you'll take out. There's a couple of little bits of gristle. Um, there's another little, jeez, uh, oh, I can't think of the name of it. Oh, no, nah, forget that. But there, there's, a, there's a little a little piece of that part of the shoulder that you don't eat and you don't serve. 
It's got like a little bit of green green muscle into it, a little bit of fat. You'll take that out. Um, you're ready to go. So at the moment, I'm using uh, Blue's Hog Pork Injection to inject my pork butts. Uh, previous to that, I was using Butcher's uh, open, open Pork or Open Pit Pork and Open Pork Injection, a combination of the two. Uh, that was before Tim had his um, pork injection. Now that he's got his pork injection, um, I'm utilising that. Um, I'll inject the money muscle in around underneath the fat where the spaghetti is, into your tubes, into your horn, underneath the bone, get it as much flavour as injected as possible. Um, I do a shaker bottle, which is 500 mils, uh, as much as possible all the way around. And once I've done that, I'll roughly 12 hours before I want to start cooking. So I usually put my pork butts on at 7 o'clock in the morning. So at 7 o'clock at night or 6 o'clock, I'll inject. And then 7 o'clock at night, the night before, I'll rub rub up my pork. And at the moment, I'm using... Um, uh, Sweet Money from Big Papa Smokers, uh, Simply Marvellous Spicy Apple, and a, uh, a light dusting of um, Genius Trinity over the top as well. Once that's all rubbed up, so probably medium to light rub of each one, or the last one, actually the Trinities are really just a light, light dusting over the top. Um, I'll let that sit for 12 hours, then... On the smoker at 7 o'clock, I'll cook that out until it's a, the money muscle probes that are around about 155, 160 Fahrenheit. Then just going off the money muscle, I'm not going off the tubes because my main priority is to utilise the money muscle uh, for my hand in box. So... Once, once that hits around about 150, 160, then I'll, I'll take it off. I'll wrap it in foil and I'll use a mixture of uh, Blue's Hog Tennessee Red, maple syrup and some brown sugar and a little bit of uh, unsalted butter because there's enough salt in the rubs as it is. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll wrap that up and put it back on the smoker till the money muscle probes soft. That's, that's my indication. Um, if the money muscle's nice and tender and it probes soft, I take it off and then I let it rest. If it's an hour and a half, two hours, whatever it be, it, it'll sit in the, the cambro until I'm ready to pull it and take out my uh, bits that I'm going to put in the box. So what uh, what temperature do you run the, the smoker at there when you're cooking the pork? The, ga- the gateway... Um, it runs at uh, 300, so while it's unwrapped, I'll cook my pork butt at 300 Fahrenheit, fat side down. Um, there are guys, and, and I know Tim, Tim and Brad do it, they flip their pork butts and they'll cook skin, meat side down. Um, I, I've done it a couple of times just to see what it does. I find that it, it moves the bark a little bit. Uh, it does help even the cooking out. But what for me, my, my my what I'm looking for is the money muscle and the spaghetti and some chunks. So all the meats at the bottom I want cooked, not necessarily the top part. Mm. So it depends on how you cook. You can they call it the burn and turn. So you, and, and they'll do the same with ribs. Uh, years, a couple of years back, you know there was jokes of you know you always got to hang your ribs, um, you know. Now there's jokes out there as um, they say, oh, it's 2019, you, your ribs, you lay your ribs flat and you burn and turn them. <laughs> and, and that's what Tim and Brad do. Sometimes they hang them, sometimes they lay them flat. It all depends on how they feel. Oh, fair yeah. enough. And I guess on the uh, on the individual rack themselves when they actually see it. Yeah, look, 100%. I've always hung my ribs, but that's me. But, you know, you'll hear some guys say that when you hang your ribs, it actually stretches them, and it, it pull it, the meat stretches. Okay. Whereas, whereas when you lay them flat, the meat meat all stays together. So there's there's a method behind both. 
both both ideas. Yeah, interesting. Or really both, interesting. Both, both cookery methods. Um, like I say, I, I've done both, and baby backs I'll always lay flat, whereas spares I'll hang, and I've done vice versa. So, but getting back to the pork butt, yeah, you know, I want to use my spaghetti, and I want to use um, the money muscle for my box, and some of the tubes and chunks underneath, I'll, I'll pull them out and I'll separate them and I'll have a look to see which one's the, which one's the most moist or which one looks like the best bark or the best flavour and, you know, get there and taste which ones I want to use. So they're the ones that go in. Awesome. And so is there a particular, um, like, I guess, look to the spaghetti that you're looking for or, like... What sort of what sort of catches your eye when you're breaking down that um, that that pork butt? Okay, so when the spaghetti, when you when you flip it, I when you, I remove my money muscle and I put that to the side. Then I flip my pork butt over. I take off the fat, and then underneath that fat, there's a bit of sinew, and then under that little bit of sinew, you'll find your spaghetti, and what or your bacon, it might be called. And what I'll do is I'll get there and I'll peel it back and I'll, I'll start separating the bacon into strands. Oh, wow. And and, and, and that, that bacon then is it's full of flavour. It's full of all the juice and all the yumminess. And you'll you'll shred it like, and it looks like spaghetti. There is another part of the muscle in the pork shoulder that I probably shouldn't have called the bacon spaghetti, but there's another part of the muscle in the, in the um, pork shoulder that, that actually – when you pull it and you shred it out, it does look like long strands of spaghetti. So what I'm looking for is the bacon under my fat on my pork shoulder, which I put in my hand in box, and then I'll, I'll peel the bone back and I'll pull out a couple of chunks, a couple of tubes under there, and I'll utilise that as some chunks in my, um, in my hand in box as well. So I have money muscle, um, bacon, and then a couple of chunks in there as well. Oh, it sounds so good. So good. Well, yeah, without without seeing a video of it or a picture of it, it's, yeah, it, it, it's it's interesting to try and describe it to you over, over an interview this way. Yeah, the uh, the, the audio medium, you have to be as, as sort of verbally descriptive as possible. It's it's an interesting exercise. No, nah, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, listen, man, thank you so much for that lesson. That was really fantastic to sort of re- really get in there and pick your brains about the, uh, about the pork, but thank you so much for that. So now yeah. we've, uh, we're sort of heading up to about an hour now. So I'm, I'm going to hand the studio over to you. The, uh, the, the mixing desk is all yours. Give some shout outs to who you want to give some shout outs and tell everybody where they can track down the King and his queue. Um, look, currently, the King is Q, uh, we haven't got any booked events or markets coming up. Um, so uh, we, we are catering a, a private function in February, but there's nothing nothing coming up at the moment. But if you wish to follow us, uh, catch up on our Facebook page or Instagram, and we're always posting where we're going to be. Um, but our, like I say, our next, our next competition will be at um, in uh, Bundalong in Victoria. And then in, in Perth, uh, shout outs to um, Gateway Drum Smokers and Blues Hog Charcoal Sources, Rubs and Injections. Um, without, without those guys, um, barbecue for me, yeah, since I learned how to cook on a drum was, yeah, a life-changing event. Um, no, more, no more offsets for competition, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. you, uh, you, you love that getting, sleep, eh? Yeah, oh, look, you'll get the argument. When I first started, it was all about the offset. And then I got introduced to a drum and it was like, hang on a sec. <laughs> half, the, half the time is maximum flavour. It means I can sleep at night and what I can do is like, yep. And look, I'll be honest, I've got a pellet grill as well. So I'm not going to take the piss out of the guys with pellet grills. I'll actually, <laughs> no, not at all. I'll, I'll recommend a pellet, to, pellet grill to, um, you know, Johnny that comes up and asks me about barbecue and then I'll ask him how he's going to do it and what he's going to use and I'll, I'll always recommend a pellet grill and then if he says, oh, I want to do something a bit more, you know, with charcoal, then, then it goes to a drum and then if he really wants to go on the offset, then I'll always say, how much do you want to spend? Because, you know, 
an offset at Bunnings is a couple hundred dollars or an offset at Barbecue Galore is another about $1,500 or at Barbecue Smokers, it can be a couple of thousand dollars. So, you know, it all depends on where you want to go. Um, shout out to Barbecue Smokers. Those guys are awesome. They've looked after me well. Always been there for the drums, charcoal, rubs as well. So happy days. Beautiful, man. Well, I'm just going to say once again, thank you for coming to the confessional and thank you for being a part of the show. Uh, cheers, Ben. It's been good. Thanks for having me on board and it's nice to chat with you and hopefully see you along the barbecue circuit. And there you have it, folks. That's our interview with Paul from The King and His Q. Huge thanks to Paul for, for coming on the show. They're definitely one of the teams to watch in 2020. And given his pension for interstate and now we've learned international travel, no doubt he's going to be coming to a barbecue comp near you. So that's it for today's show. Do me a favor, tell a friend about the show and make sure you invite them to the Smoking Hot Confessions barbecue community on Facebook because as my cousin-in-law from Arkansas would say, it's a good time. So till next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips and Ben's own confessions.